Hello and welcome to Felix's First Time. In today's video we have an interview with Nicole Stott, a retired NASA astronaut. If you liked today's video don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. I've got about, I've only got 10 questions for you. Okay, all right. We'll get into that right now. Okay, cool. Um, could you explain who you are? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm Nicole Stott and I'm a retired NASA astronaut and aquanaut and I can now add author to that because I just finished writing my book and I'm an artist and most importantly I'm a mom yeah um did you always want to become an astronaut when you were younger um I don't I don't know that I didn't want to be one I don't but it wasn't like but I mean I'm old enough that I got to see that first moon landing I watched it on tv with my family and um, so I have memory of that and thinking even then I was six or seven, you know, thinking that that was really cool, you know, knowing that was an extraordinary thing to have had happen. And when I think back on it, I realized that it probably did have influence on me for sure, certainly in things I thought were possible. And but it was a little bit of a kind of a windy path, I guess, because what I really wanted to do was know how things fly. Um, my dad built and flew small airplanes as a hobby growing up. So I was out at the airport, our family was all the time. And so I got to see all that, meet flying people. And I wanted to know, I wanted to fly myself, but I also wanted to know how things fly. So that took me to study engineering. And then from there, while I got a job at NASA, I discovered, man, you know, what astronauts do. And that really started to encourage me, like, you know, maybe that's something I could do, even though for the longest time, I thought that's only what other special people get to do. Yeah. Must have been pretty amazing watching the moon landing on TV. It really was. And I have, you know, I, you probably realize now, too, there's like vivid memories you have, right? And I mean, there's things you think, wow, why don't I remember that? But the moon landing sure was one. I'm, I have vivid memory of sitting with my sister and my parents in front of our black and white TV. And for some reason, I remember eating a grilled cheese sandwich. And, and then later when we knew they were on the moon, like going at night, going outside and looking at the moon and just talking about it, which was, I mean, it really just seemed like incredible. Like how could there be people up there? And you kind of look, I remember looking, thinking, could I see them? <laughs> of course you can't, but, um, but that was, yeah. Yeah, really. Um, and in school we had, you know, the TVs, if there was something going on with space, when I was in school as a kid, they would roll, they'd roll this big TV in and plug it in. Everybody sit on the floor to watch it. I don't know if that happens today or not with classes. Yeah. Um, can you give me an idea of um, what your training involved before prior to a mission? Yeah, well, um, well, when you're first selected to be an astronaut, um, it's like a lot like going back to school and you're not training for a mission yet. You're just training to see if they even want to keep you as an astronaut, right? So um, it is a lot like going back to school. You're learning all about like the systems, how the spaceship and the space station run and what you got to do to take care of it. Uh, you're learning all about the different science that might go on up there just in general. And, and then you're learning how to do things like spacewalks and fly the robotic arm, you know, that big white crane looking thing yeah. we have on the station that you move around and, uh, and how to do the science experiments and how to maintain the, you know, the shuttle or the station. And so there's a lot of that that happens in like the first two years that you get selected. And on top of that, what I thought was the most difficult thing was I had to learn how to speak Russian. And that was, that was fun, but painful. <laughs> and then, and then, it, then you're, you're working, you know, you're working as an astronaut supporting other missions. You might be in mission control doing the Capcom job or, helping develop procedures for a spacewalk or for a science experiment, or even working on like new programs, like new rockets that are being developed and stuff. You can help with that as well. And then somewhere along the line, you get assigned to a, a space mission. And when that happens, then you're still doing all that stuff you were doing before, but now it's really focused on what that particular mission is going to be. 
you know, which science are you going to be doing? What crew are you going to be working with up there? And that kind of thing. And then on top of it, you know, to do like to do the spacewalk training, we get to get in the big white suit and go in the pool. You know, we have this big pool that we use to train in. Um, that's really awesome. We fly in little T-38, uh, like the Air Force trainer jets. And because that they want you to get experience in a really complex, you know, environment like an airplane where, you know, you're having to work like a crew, just like you would if you're on a spaceship. And, and then we do all kinds of what we call expeditionary training, which is um, like going off on a big camping trip somewhere, you know, going off to the Utah Canyon lands and it's just the six of you and you're there for 10 days working as a crew and you've got all different kinds of objectives that you have to meet and going off for cold weather survival. Um, I remember doing cold weather survival in Moscow uh, and it was the coldest winter there in a hundred years. <laughs> It's like minus 45 or something. And, you know, and again, you're learning how to work as a crew, but you're learning a lot about yourself. Like what are your own strengths and weaknesses, right? And how are you going to manage those as part of your crew to be successful? And then the absolute best was going and living underwater for 18 days on a, on an undersea mission um, in this place called Aquarius right off the coast of Key Largo, Florida, and it's this habit, go check it out. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link to where you can go see what goes on there. But it's this um, like school bus sized habitat that sits about 60 feet underwater. And we go down there and we were there for 18 days, living and working just like you would if you were in space. And absolutely the closest thing I've ever done to what it was like to live in space. And we had a real mission and it was like you were like just surrounded by the planet, you know, it was really, really cool. Yeah. Wow. What's, yeah. what's your most memorable moment in space? Oh, that's a, that's a really difficult one. Cause I kind of, when I think about it now, it's like, it's all one big moment, right? Everything was just better than I expected it to be. It really was. I mean, I feel like I have a better understanding of the word awe, <laughs> like what awesome means. And, um, but I think that there were highlights. Um, for sure, I have this like really special memory of the first phone call I made to my son from space because we have really good communication up there. I could talk to my family every day. And, um, but that first, like that first phone call, oh, I'm calling my son from space. And he was seven when I flew to space the first time. So, so that was really special. And, uh, and then doing the spacewalk, um, got to do a spacewalk, that was, six and a half hours of just surreal awesomeness and floating, <laughs> you know, getting to float and move in three dimensions. I imagine you could just like push off your chair and float up to the ceiling and around and just be anywhere and not feel like anything was up or down. That's pretty incredible. And uh, looking out the window, um, seeing earth from space is pretty spectacular. Yeah. And the fact that you could do that with like five or six other people, you know, to be up there sharing it with people from all over the world is pretty interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's more than one moment I know, sorry. <laughs> um, can you tell us a bit about, more about the space missions you've been on? Sure, so I, I got to fly twice in space. Um, my first time was back in 2009, so a long time ago now, and and that was, I got to fly up to the space station on the space shuttle Discovery. And then I got dropped off there and I lived for a little over three months on the space station, living and working there. And then I came home with uh, a crew, uh, Atlantis, on an Atlantis space shuttle. And, uh, and then about a year and a half later, I flew on the final flight of the space shuttle Discovery. And that was again to the space station but we were only there for two weeks. So it seemed like way too short. Like they had to pull my clawing hands off the hatch to get me back in the shuttle to take me home. Um, but really, really neat because each mission had some different stuff going on. Um, on the first one was the one I got to do the spacewalk, which was really incredible. Um, I flew, I had the chance to fly the robotic arm quite a few times um, to grab this cargo vehicle that was coming in and then to fly crew members around and do, 
different stuff with that and all kinds of science experiments on board. And then just every day kind of making sure the space station was running properly too, you know, making sure the, the bathroom's working and the kitchen's working and all of the systems that are there to keep us alive, make sure they're working. Wow. Um, what advice would you give to an aspiring astronaut? Wow, I think it's the same advice I'd give to somebody aspiring to do anything. And the, the first thing would be to just really, I mean, really pay attention to what you enjoy, right? What is it you're most curious about? What do you want to learn more about? You know, what, what do you see yourself doing? I mean, I, I think you kind of have to see it be it too, right? You know, like really imagine yourself doing that thing and, and then decide if you think you'd like it. <laughs> Right. And for the astronaut role in particular, I think when you talk to most astronauts, you'll find what they were doing before they were, were an astronaut, they really loved it. They really, really enjoyed it. They were excited about it. And, and if they had never gotten picked to be an astronaut, they'd still be loving it and they'd be learning more and, you know, and doing more with it. Um, so that I think is, is really interesting uh, about it. And and then, of course, for the astronaut job, like any job, there's the basic requirements, like you have to have a certain kind of education, and of course, you have to pass certain medical tests and have to have worked for a little while doing, doing something in that field of study that you had. But what I love is outside of those very basic requirements, it's really wide open. Like you want to fly in space with people that you would enjoy hanging out with too, right? You know, that you know you're going to have a good time with. And um, so you want to be there with people that have interests outside of just what they studied at school. You know, are they scuba divers? Are they rock climbers? Are they race car drivers? Do they do art or music or, you know, things like that that just kind of make you the person that you are too? Because it'd be really boring if you had to live in space for three months or six months or longer with five other people that are exactly like you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're now a retired astronaut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what do you yeah. do nowadays? Well, I do stuff like this that you see behind me. I work with, um, kids all over the world, creating these really cool art spacesuits and and other projects like that. The way we met was through, you know, through an introduction with um, St. Jude and the Inspiration4 mission with um, Jared and his team, because um, I think we're gonna end up doing some work with those guys, with, with kids that are at St. Jude and um, create some artistic, interesting things for that mission. Uh, I also, I do stuff like this, like speaking events and I try to get out to a lot of schools and other organizations to, to talk to kids. And, but this is my favorite thing right now is um, working with the art stuff because I don't know if you, I got to paint while I was in space. I did a watercolor painting in space, which was super fun. And, and I think if you look over time at what astronauts are doing in space, you'll see art and music and poetry and all kinds of things have been going on up there since the very beginning. And, when I was thinking about retiring from NASA, um, I wanted, I think everyone wants to be able to share the experience they had, right? And then do something good, do something better with it. And I just kept coming back to that painting I got to do in space and I knew I'd be doing art myself. So why not combine all those things I love and do art in space and work with kids and hopefully do something meaningful. Would you ever go up into space again? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I would absolutely love it. And I tell people, ask me when I'm 92, would you want to go to space to get any answers? Absolutely, yes. So, so when you go, could you call me and please take me with you? <laughs> How about you? Do you want to go? Would you yeah, like to go to space? Actually, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's, there's just something about... I don't know, you know, just being in a different environment, seeing how our bodies can adapt to new and different environments and, um, you know, getting to fly float like that is really awesome. What do you think about the recent developments in space travel, like the new rockets and going to the thought of going to Mars? And yeah, thumbs up. I, you know, I'm really excited about it. And I live here in Florida on the West coast of Florida. So you know, just straight across the state is 
the Kennedy Space Center where I had the chance to work before becoming an astronaut. And it's just really exciting to see everything that's going on. I mean, I've missed the space shuttle. I, I you know, I was kind of like, why can't we just keep flying in the space shuttle until we have these other rockets? And it just never works out that way. But to see my friends and colleagues flying now on, you know, on the SpaceX Dragon and knowing that the Boeing vehicle is, is going to be ready soon for, for crews to fly, that we're still flying with our partners in Russia on the Soyuz spacecraft. That's, you know, that's really important. Um, you know, and some of the other space vehicles that are being developed, you know, Virgin Galactic developing their like suborbital vehicle, which ultimately I'll think be, will be how we end up traveling from one place to another, you know, right here on the planet and, you know, Artemis with going back to the moon. And then some of those same companies looking at how they help make that happen and establishing a permanent presence there, a settlement on the moon. That's all about, just like everything in space that we do is it's all about improving life on earth. How are we living in space in a way that makes life on earth better? You know, either in how we live here now or how we'll live in the future, how we need to be multi-planetary species at some point, even out of this solar system to really like keep the human thing going. And, you know, and the idea that like, like you, you and your peers are going to be like going or the one watching what's happening on Mars, which is just incredible to me. I mean, it, it is going to happen. And yeah, it's just neat to see the different ways things are developing to do that. And I really love that both like right now it's NASA and these companies working together to, to make it happen and all of the other um, space agencies. I mean, that's one of the greatest things about the space station program, right? Is that it's, it is international. For as long as you've been alive, I say this to my son too, you know, that your entire life, there have been people circling on our planet every 90 minutes on that space station from representing 15 different countries, five international space agencies and living and working up there as one crew, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's how we should be living like crewmates down here on spaceship earth. Don't you think? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, traditionally the space industry seems to be quite male dominated is that true and um how was that experience for you um i think it still is uh but it's much better and it's not just like you know male female kind of thing it's like you look at and I, i'll speak to human space flight only because that's really what i know but i mean you look take for example mission control right in houston <clears throat> or the launch control center in florida we were talking about the Apollo missions. When Apollo launched, there were no women in mission control, none. In launch control center, there was one, Joanne Morgan. She was, and you can find her in the pictures, just like this one woman smack dab in the middle of the control center there. And now both of those control centers are run by really incredible women. And when you look in, you know, you get the view, the camera view into the control center, you see all the people, you know, working there. It's just like this mass, this mix of humanity. It's not like you're looking, oh, where's Joanne? You know, because I can't, I got to find that one woman that's in there. It's just humanity is represented now as part of human space flight. And I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, but it evolved really, really nicely. I think it's a wonderful example for all kinds of other industry to see. You know, when we go back to the moon, there's going to be at least one woman on that flight, which I think is pretty incredible to think about and, um, and totally appropriate. And, and in NASA astronaut office right now, uh, there's about 40 astronauts and roughly 40% are women. That's huge. I mean, that's huge compared to when you look at universities where um, like engineering, for example, engineering colleges are struggling, at least in the US to get like 25% female enrollment. So you look at that where, where the people are coming from to be astronauts. And then you look at the astronaut office and the numbers are just really good in the astronaut office, but we need to be encouraging more of it to go on. Like we need to be getting to girls at your age to say, Hey, come on, you can do this and you should want to do this. And, um, yeah, 
I don't know. I feel like I have to ask you, I don't know if you've, you've found this, but with my son, I noticed that like at career day at school, when people would come in to talk about what they do, I would notice with my son that it wasn't all that important, whether it was a man or woman up there talking about what they were doing. It was just, wow, do I think that's cool? Would I want to do that kind of thing? And for the girls though, it seems to be a little bit more like, okay, I need to see somebody that looks like me that's done it, you know, and to, to have a little bit more self-confidence and belief in, um, you know, and the, that it's possible, I guess. I don't know what you've seen in school with, um, you know, with your classmates and stuff or how you feel about that. But um, I just think, I don't, I don't know what it is because I don't like to stereotype anything, but because um, I always like to say the rocket ship doesn't care if you're a boy or girl, right? <laughs> So. Wow. Um, do you have any plans for the future at all? Well, yeah, I just, um, I just finished writing my book and it comes out in October. Um, and so I think I'll be spending some time, you know, promoting it and talking about the message behind it, which really is, it's not a memoir. Um, there's certainly, certainly have stories in it about like my experience in space and growing up and stuff, things that influenced me, but it's really about what we talked about earlier about how we've built, how is it that we've built this mechanical life support system in space, right? And we've got these people from all over the world living there peacefully, successfully for over 20 years, right? And in this place, we are like so totally aware of our environment and what we need to do with it to keep us alive. So every day I knew how much CO2 was in my atmosphere on the space station, how much clean drinking water we had, you know, if the hull of the station was in good shape, if my crew members were feeling good, you know, if everybody was doing well, I knew that every day on the space station. And to me, it really is, it's this perfect example of how we should take the ways we live and work there and apply them to ourselves as crewmates down here on Spaceship Earth. And it's what I talked about anyway, but I decided to write a book about it. So, you know, that'll be coming out. I'm really encouraged about more and more work with the Space for Art Foundation. That's really where I feel like, you know, my heart is now as far as, as working. Um, and I think we're doing some cool stuff. And, and then, you know, my son is getting ready to graduate from high school. So he's going to be going on to college. He's going to the same school I went to, which I'm really excited about. Um, he should earn, he's working on his private pilot's license right now. So he should have that by the time he graduates from high school. And so he's thinking, you know, I just want, I'm really interested to see what's he going to figure out? What is it that he's just really excited about, curious about, and wants to you know, do and use to help make life better, you know, for everybody around him. So that's, that's really my, I guess, my three main things. Wow. That's yeah. one of the questions I've got for you today. You, you okay. have to answers to the, my questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was really nice to meet you. And uh, what are you up to? Can I just ask you what you're up to? Um, well, at the moment, I'm, I'm working from home. I'm doing school from home. Right. So it, but when I'm older, I'd quite like to do stuff. In space yeah in space yeah excellent have you ever met or heard um tim peak speak over there no. in the uk um, you know he i know who he is but i've never really no yeah he does a lot of keep an eye out for him i don't know if you follow anybody on social media at all or like uh he just wrote a book too and of course he grew up in the uk so it's it's it might be interesting to read his book it just came out i, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, um, uh, it should be really good. He's a great guy and he does a lot of events, um, through the science museum, uh, in London and, you know, that get broadcast out and stuff. But, but I, I think I'd, I'd recommend reading his book because it's, it could probably give you a little, you know, some great ideas about what you're thinking about too. Um, I'll look, I'll look into yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. He's really cool. And, um, yeah, great. Well, I wish you all the best and thanks for reaching out. I'm very happy to speak with you and I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was very nice all to talk right. to you too. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Coming up, we have more interviews with Inspiration4 entrants and the final interview with the final two Inspiration4 crew members. So stay tuned. Bye.